All right, we are back in the uh, book of James, the epistle of James, chapter two, as we are working through this eminently practical epistle during Lent. Um, I say practical, <clears throat> and we will have some of the more famous verses and concepts in this very chapter today. Um, but I find James to be particularly appropriate during Lent as we are considering our spiritual disciplines of Lent. Um, a spiritual discipline with whatever it is that we choose to take on or to give up, there is an element of our physical actions associated really with all of them. Let's say during Lent, we will pray more. Well, there is a physical action to the decision of prayer where you take the time, you take the concentration, whether or not you have a particular posture, but you are physically doing something in your day that's seeking that connection and time of fellowship with God. Uh, if you want to do some increased Bible study or devotional reading, you are you know, physically making choices to read. If it's about um, service, you're you know, physically actively serving. Even if it is um, abstaining from something or fasting from something, there is a physicality, obviously, to those things as well. Um, that what we refer to as spiritual disciplines are not disconnected from our bodies. And James uh, is so crystal clear, really throughout, but definitely today, in the connection between our faith and our works, the insides of ourselves, the spiritual, mental, emotional lives connected to our, our actions, our behaviors, our words, um, that these things ought to be inextricably linked. And if they're not, there's a problem. Um, and so, you know, again, I think this is... Um, a particularly appropriate in, in, in Lent, where we are uh, taking 40 days of focus and purpose, uh, looking for that spiritual growth and development, uh, most specifically through discipline. And though that is, that is an internal and an external uh, set of actions. Okay, so um, last week when we started off in James and we had gotten uh, a, a cancellation the week before, so we, we, we had to postpone and then we started last week, uh, it is my intention to go through the, the whole chapter, but because this is the second class and you might have read to prepare, uh, I just wanted to open up if there were any opening questions or uh, thoughts, uh, anything that, that, that struck you in a particular way, you can obviously wait until we get there verse by verse, but this is a fine time to say, you know, well, this is what this chapter made me think of, or this section, uh, I wonder what, and, and we can, you know, make sure that we address that from the get-go. So um, anything in your pre-reading of James chapter two that somebody would like to would like to bring up now, Charlie. So it's extra fun. Everyone is seated outside of camera range, yet making as much noise as they possibly can. And it looks like I am holding a class <laughs> to poltergeists. Um, when the reality is there's six people in here who are all very, very carefully just outside of the range of the camera. So, okay. Um, anyway, so anything to bring up uh, from the get-go about James chapter two? Okay, anything from James one that in reflection or retrospect, we either did not bring up or you've been just kind of ruminating on since last time? He calls a spade a spade. Yeah, I think that's for sure. Um, he doesn't mince many words. 
there's a lot of clarity. Um, there is a lot of directness. You might even call it blunt. Um, I'm not going to say it's sharp and hard so much as it is very straightforward. Very straightforward. Anything else? Okay, well, let's hit it. <clears throat> let's uh, let's take a section at a time. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. So suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Okay, so this uh, first little section, this is uh, verses one through seven. Um, uh, this uh, study Bible that I have gives a little title to this section called Favoritism Forbidden. Uh, and it's both alliterative and I think pretty accurate. Um, what is the favoritism he's talking about? Appearances affecting. Appearances affecting how people are treated. And in particular, this passage, what kind of appearances? Money. 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 People who have an outward demonstration of wealth and people who have an outward demonstration of poverty. So we might expect somebody who is wealthy to have fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and look well put together. And someone who is poor, how might we expect them to look? Dirty. Dirty. Shabby. Shabby. Yeah, their clothes are, you know, torn or disheveled or just old or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so when we get an epistle, remember that um, we have kind of, let's say, two general types. Epistles are letters. They are sent to someone. Um, in this sense, they are sent generally to a church, for instance, or to a group of believers. Um, remember that uh, James writes in the very beginning in, in, in chapter one that this is a letter intended for uh, the 12 tribes scattered throughout the nation. We talked about this being basically for the early Christians who were, they were, they were Jews. They were Jews convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And they desire to be disciples, but they are not just around Jerusalem, but, you know, kind of scattered in the diaspora and different uh, parts of the Roman Empire in different countries. And so this letter is kind of going out to a broad group of people. But when you get an epistle with some kind of correction or admonition, it's usually in response to something. Yeah, I wonder if it's like... Paul's letters, you know, he responds to questions from the church. Right. And I was wondering whether James was responding to something. It sort of seems that way in this sense, right? This seems, this feels a little specific, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, this seems to be not just generally good advice, although it is. It kind of seems like it's in response to something. So, yeah, for instance, when Paul is writing to one of the churches, you will often get um, his side of a conversation. They've asked him a question or they've told him about a problem. And so he's writing the answer. This is what you need to do. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you should do instead, you know, whatever it might be. And you can kind of work backwards sometimes and make an educated guess about what, what was actually going on. Um, you know, for instance, in, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, he talks a lot about being members of the same body. He talks a lot about this, 
various spiritual gifts and how they ought to be properly versus improperly used. What does that suggest? It suggests that there wasn't enough unity in Corinth and that the spiritual gifts were being misused. But otherwise, why would he write that? I mean, we, we can't know that for sure, but it makes the most sense. And I think that's a very reasonable assumption on our part. So uh, as we are seeing this, I think there's a general, this is the right thing to do in all times, places, and circumstances. But it seems pretty specific, doesn't it? Yes. And I'm thinking maybe he's seen this happen. Now, if this is uh, James, the brother of Jesus, he is also referred to by another name, uh, which we, we we talked about the reason why uh, last time. He's also sometimes referred to as James of Jerusalem. Remember in Acts chapter 15, he presides over the council of Jerusalem where the where Paul brings the issue, is the gospel for the Gentiles or not? And if, do those Gentiles have to become Jews first in order to receive Christ? And so James is connected to Jerusalem, whether he's just there occasionally or whether he lives there now. So it seems to me that he's had plenty of opportunities to see this behavior in action. Um, if Jerusalem is the big city, which it is, I think you tend to see that mix of the richest and the poorest in close proximity in the city more than you do outside of the city. I think it kind of flattens outside of the city, whether it's the suburbs or the country or a village or whatever, where people are just a little more uh, kind of, a, of the same strata for the most part. You could be on the top end or the bottom end, but you don't tend to have the extremes in a smaller uh, community. Um, but in Jerusalem, you would have most likely the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor being the big city. And what's something else that you might expect in Jerusalem, the big city, that you wouldn't necessarily expect in a small fishing village off the Sea of Galilee? Learning, crime. This is some, something of an unfair question because it's, it's like I've got something in my head and it's not super obvious. So, um, strangers, people you don't know. You have visitors to Jerusalem all the time. If somebody comes, remember, this is sort of presupposing you don't know this person, right? Because he doesn't say when Bob, who's rich, comes in, but Tim, who's poor, comes in. He says, if a rich man comes in, and there seems to be a, oh, oh please, please, sir, come sit here, as though you don't know them. Or as, they, as though they don't have a, a regular seat. Remember, if this is synagogical worship, you tended to have your place kind of like there are certain pews at nine o'clock that you don't sit in because somebody else is going to sit there. A sign seating. It is, uh, it might as well be. Um, <laughs> Uh, total aside, but uh, I remember uh, several weeks ago telling Charlie about my experience many years ago at Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia, and that's one of those, uh, this was George Washington's church, and apparently several churches can say that, but they have in the main chapel preserved several of the historic um, pew boxes, so you literally had like two pews that faced each other, and it was built as a box with a little wall and there were doors and you open the doors to get in and you sat in your family's box and it was a box because they, they would build a fire in the middle of it during the winter so you'd have a little fire your your personal fire in church so you could keep warm as you you know we're, we're in the we're in the church service so anyway these boxes have plaques on them identifying the historical figure like this here's the washington family pew box and that, okay, you can go sit in it and feel like George Washington for a second. So anyway, um, this, I think, presupposes a place where you don't know people. Um, and you're sort of trying to make an impression. Or you're just trying to figure them out. Um, 
if you knew these people really well, maybe this doesn't happen. Uh, but here's what's happening. People who show up looking fancy are treated differently than people who are showing, who look up showing poor. Well, it's a good thing that that never happens anymore. <laughs> right. So how might such things happen even now? Okay. Um, somebody who comes in looking very sharply put together, do people greet them differently than somebody who comes in, you know, sort of shabby? I think that, you know, part of it is human nature, but what's the deal with human nature? Remember, human nature is broken because of our sin. So even though it's natural, that doesn't mean it's right. It is easy to do, doesn't mean it's correct. Um, I noticed there's a difference when I was at like a dress to church versus especially it's cold. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be in like a sweatshirt, but I do notice people. Why are you so nice to today? I mean, like as oh. opposed to last as time, opposed to all the times I don't. <laughs> right. But you know, I mean, still, still those things spirit showing up. Sure. But also, I I remember um when I was in. Uh, Divinity school, there was a big push for, you know, you're you're not respecting God if you show up out of people. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking there's a lot of people that can't afford a minister. Yeah. And if we have that in the heads of future ministers, I'm I'm very conflicted personally. I really am, and I'll tell you why. Um like, I, I say this as somebody who wears shorts almost every day. And I wore shorts and a t-shirt and sandals for three years in seminary. You know, even in the cold, um, I was that guy. Um, I'm a casual man. I either look like I'm about to celebrate the Eucharist because I'm wearing a collar and my pants and everything else, or I look like I'm gonna play basketball. I have I have very little in between. And that's that's my fault. And I'm just weird that way. But I see... I see reasons for both. I don't want there to be a barrier ever. I don't want somebody to say, I can't come to church because I don't have nice enough clothes or I don't, I can't feel comfortable because I'm constantly worried about what other people are thinking. At the same time, I have seen the benefit, the internal benefit of what happens when I do my best, yeah. regardless of what that best is. I remember... I remember being in Haiti out in the countryside and you could pick out in this village, the homes of the Christians. When I say dirt poor, I mean literal dirt floors. Those Christians had swept their dirt floors every day. There was an element that they were seeking to show of gratitude and faithfulness by taking care of what little they had. And it didn't matter that it was just a dirt floor. It was going to be a swept dirt floor. And I I just wonder what happens because when we hit the 80s and the seeker-sensitive movement, there was a big push, like be as casual as possible. Um, and it was really like, a, like the pendulum swung. You're actually more faithful when you show up, you know, in, 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 in shirts and a t-shirt because you have... You've set behind you the things of this world, and you're, it's just like it's a spiritual choice. And I'm, But I wonder if we don't lose something in that direction, too. Like, either swing of the pendulum takes us too far. And I think our bodies do communicate something about our intentions. And maybe it's just a matter of with what, what means I have, in the same way that we seek to offer our best in worship through our intentionality, doesn't our appearance have something to do with that? And like I said, I, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted. I I wish I knew a singular correct answer, but I don't know there is one. I hundred percent. And I and I wouldn't want somebody to not come. Because I don't really have it in me to, you know, 
iron a shirt or something like that's that's so secondary to material but at the same time um i think we've felt that connection between our bodies and our souls which is supposed to be there that when we are when we dress a certain way we feel a certain way and we wouldn't show up to a meeting with you know, oh, the, the the president is visiting and has called upon, you know, the mayor, uh, our, our boss, you know, we would, you know, you would dress in a manner that seemed befitting to the occasion. What is befitting to corporate worship in the presence of an almighty God? And, and like I said, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted. Um, but that's a, that's a, that's the personal part of it. Now the external part of it is the judgment from others. Um, because as I'm saying like, oh, well maybe you do the best of what you have. The other person doesn't know what you have. Uh, so then our ability to look at someone from the outside, how do we know that they're, that was the best that they could do today? And I don't know that we can know that. So what, how are we going to treat them? The same. We should. Clearly that was an issue then. And I would say it remains, it remains an issue now. I'm going to, I don't say this as an accolade. I say this as an example. This was a discipline that I took on early in my ministry at the recommendation of a very senior very experienced priest. I don't know on purpose what anybody gives financially. I don't. Now, I know that people give, and I want to know that people give. And I've asked, like, you know, if somebody stops giving or somebody starts giving or whatever it is, because that is a pastoral matter. Your stewardship in a, in a general sense is a pastoral matter. But I, on purpose, have no idea if the person in a three-piece suit gives one dollar, and the person wearing shorts and a t-shirt is dropping a thousand. I have, I just don't know. And the reason, the rationale behind it, as was given to me many years ago, is roughly this: that as you're the pastor to everybody, but you're also a, a human with your own frailties and your own ways that, you know, no matter how hard you try, you're going to mess stuff up. Um, therefore, if you don't know, then that's one level of kind of protection of just making the choice to treat everybody the same. Uh, it's not foolproof, but it's, 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 a, it's a discipline that I think is, has been of help in the past, I hope. Um, that I don't want to even inadvertently treat somebody differently because I'm either trying to curry favor or I'm worried that they might, oh no, they're going to stop writing a big check or something like, just treat them the same. Ostensibly as, treat, as Jesus would treat them. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, but there's a, I mean, there's a financial reality that churches need finances to keep operating. And um, I can't help though, though it is completely not named here, but consider the widow's might story, right? Um, she and her poverty gave all that she had. It didn't look like anything. It looked like the smallest coin possible, but it was actually the most generous of gifts. Um, there was a, there's a story, I, I believe this is actually a real story. Um, it's not one of those like, you know, made for TV stories that we pass along because it's, it's churchy sounding. I, I believe this actually happened. Um, a pastor was hired at a Chicago area mega church and he showed up, I think it was like the week before his first scheduled service as a homeless person in disguise just to see how he was treated. 
Um, I think it's real. I am very conflicted about that story. Like, I think there's value in having a church self-reflect with some knowledge about this is what happened. Because apparently he wasn't treated well or very or somewhat dismissively. But at the same time, it also feels dishonest. Like, that's a weird start to a pastoral relationship that I tricked you. I, I don't know. It feels kind of strange to me, and I'm not sure how I feel about it completely. But the thought of what happens when someone outside of our ex expectation shows up. Well, I've experienced um, in down in the Keys of Grandma High School, they often think that they're homeless as well, homeless people. Ride bikes. So I, when I started going to church, I was riding my bike to church, and um, I got these benefits because two thought of the homeless. That oh. actually happened. I went back to Greece about it. She's like, just kind of blew it out. She, you know, she says, well, we don't want people being disruptive. And she said, yeah, but like, it's church. I belong to this church. Right. It's just of life. That is by Oh. Well, and, and... And so, but you know, but you know what? It was more like... It was a it was a fear-based thing. Yeah. It had some practices to it because sometimes you come in and you're struggling. But I was like, I rode my bike and I wish to go in there. So, so I know you're, you're kind of like, we'll see how people are going to act and they don't know. But the tricky part is nobody wants to feel like they're hurt. That, yeah. That just stinks. Yeah. You know, I think if that had just happened, it would have been heard about things. But because it, it does happen in churches. I, you know, it does. And, and maybe and maybe this is a matter of if I'd been burned enough, I would I would just deal with it. But I would I would want to err on the side of letting people in and then having to kick them out rather than not letting them in. You know, because who's it for? Uh, we, this is a, this is a side issue, but I remember having an, a, a problem with a boy scout who was really acting out. It was a tough family situation, but he was causing a lot of trouble. And we were talking as a group of leaders about what we were going to do about a discipline, a discipline problem that came up. And it was, it, the easy thing would be to have dropped him. We had every reason to just drop him like a rock. Voluntary organization, you're just, you're actually taking from the other boys who are here. But the decision was made to invest in him. We we're going to stick a leader with him, like the, a buddy leader all the time. And we were going to work on trying to fix this and make it better because ultimately, who needs scouting more than this kid with this really tough home situation? You know, scouting, I think, is good for all sorts of kids, but maybe the ones who need it the most are sometimes the ones who are hardest to deal with. But they need it more. Yeah. So I would rather have I would rather have the open door that we then had to shoo a couple of people out of later after you demonstrated that we got to separate you out than a closed door where people feel turned away from the get-go. And, and and again, I think there's a practicality to this, like you said, but um it's not for nothing that, that that section concludes with, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Well, That's rough. Concerning offending, give you me an opportunity to reflect on the times where maybe I was that. Because at first you're kind of irritated, like, I just can't believe the bending is, you know, getting careful. But then I thought, this is such a beautiful space to think about something. Yeah. It's like, one of the times in my life that I got this. So sure. And I may have had a good reason for it, or, or I thought it was good, that I turned somebody away and showed her and made a judgment. And right. We say don't judge a book by by its cover, and yet that is a that is a popular aphorism because it is so very, very easy to do. Right. And I I, uh, I, I don't like it, but I still do it. It's like you said, we're human. There's some automatic things that we do. And uh, this is a reminder to try and be mindful of And and it's this that next section kind of follows with a uh, kind of a reminder of the, the stakes. Like you're treating the rich person well, 
don't you remember that's the same person who is treating you and the church so poorly? You're treating the poor person dismissively. Don't you remember that blessed are the poor? That it is those who are poor in the in, in the eyes of the world that that God cares for with, with, with such depth. And I just think it's that kind of pointed reminder at the end of it, that, that not only the behavior needs to change, but just kind of a recollection of what is also happening on the outside. Isn't it funny that we can suck up to people who treat us the worst? Um, this is a very extreme example, but it's the one that pops into my head. There is a story, I believe this is from Hannah Arendt when she was doing uh, interviews with, with, with Stalin, but that Stalin once uh, gave an explanation to other Soviet leaders about his leadership philosophy. And he took a chicken, a live chicken, grabbed it tight and started pulling feathers off. He was plucking feathers and the, and the, you know, the poor chicken is you know, screaming and carrying on. And then he dropped it and the chicken is you know scurrying away so, so fearful. And then he takes food and he offers it to the chicken and the chicken comes back to him in order to eat the food. And his point was, it doesn't matter how badly you treat the people. If you give them just a little bit of what they want, they'll come crawling back to you. And it was a, a, a despicable example, but it's maybe not for nothing that we can pretty easily, I think, suck up to people who are doing the wrong thing or treating us or others poorly because we think there's something we can get out of. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah, we think there's something we can get out of. Yeah. All right, next section. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, so the royal law, the royal law, that's that's kind of an, an interesting way to put it. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. Um so remember, J Jesus himself, when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Um, and yet, Monday, Thursday, we get a mandatum, a mandate, a new commandment. Love one another, Jesus tells the disciples after washing their feet, how should we love them? As I have loved you. So the new standard, the new commandment, isn't just love your neighbor like you love yourself. Love your neighbor in the way that Jesus loves them. And that is a high standard of deed. Um, well, a lot of people don't love themselves. So when you think about how Jesus loves you, that's, that is a scare, you know. It's too variable and inconsistent with love as yourself. Sure. People who just love themselves too much or not enough. Or, so I, I, I think it's beautiful. Yeah, it kind of removes that super subjective standard, which would be different almost by any, any person. Um, But if you show favoritism, you sin. So you're 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 trying to love your neighbor in the way that you love yourself. But if you start picking and choosing, you are breaking that holy law. Does God pick and choose amongst us which are worthy of His grace and which are not? 
No. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't either. Um, the famous passage, God looks not on the outside, but in the heart. Do you remember the context that happens in? I mean, we could say multiple places, but the context that occurs to me right now, very almost verbatim. Do you remember the context? Samuel, go to the house of Jesse and anoint the next king. Ooh, it's clearly the eldest son. He's so strong and tall and handsome. Nope, it's not him. Well, it's the second son. Nope, and nope, and nope, 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 nope. Well, we've run out of sons. Well, there's just the, the one that we make work outside. We'll bring him in. And it's David. Because God looks not on the outside, but looks in the heart. So, um, God does not show favoritism in the ones that he picks and chooses to show mercy and grace to. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't either. We shouldn't look on the outside in order to determine worth. Um, which is real good for me because again, I look like I'm about to go, you know, be in a soccer game at any given moment, not like somebody who is, you know, serious and worthwhile. So I am hopeful for, you know, God to know my interior and not just the fact that I'm wearing shorts. Um, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. What is what is intended here? What is what is this? What's the meaning that he's getting at? I mean, it's just what he said. If there are ten laws, you broke one of them. You broke the law. You broke the law. That's right. The law is not separate, individual, discrete pieces. It is a unified whole. Um, so if you look behind you, we have got these these doors uh, here in the uh, here in the parish hall, and the doors have this mullioned glass. That's the that's the name of the the the, the trim that divides it, and it's it's like a it's like a rectangle and it's divided into nine smaller rectangles, right? And, and, and we have doors like that all over the property. It used to be that such doors were made one small pane of glass at a time because it was very difficult when you're blowing glass or when you're manufacturing it more as an artisan to make a big piece because big pieces were very expensive, they were hard to do. So glass was made in small pieces. This is more of an aesthetic style of an older form because we like the way it looks or because it carries a message or whatever it is, but it's super cheap. It's actually cheaper to make one big pane of glass through a machine than it is to make nine tiny panes of glass. So that looks like it's nine pieces. It's not. That's one piece of glass and the the, the the trim is a frame that they just stuck on the outside and on the other side. And it kind of sandwiches the glass. You can pull the trim off and you can see broken pieces there. And it's one piece of glass behind it. So if you break one, you're not breaking one. You, you just broke the whole thing. That whole sheet of glass is no good. You can't say, oh, I'll just fix that one little spot. Mm -mm. The whole thing is broken. So now we're talking about the law as a whole, Torah, or... I think there's also a, a theological allusion to the holiness of God. That in God's perfect holiness, anything separates us from perfection. 99% um, is not 100%. 100% is a whole. And any deviation from that is something less than the whole. Anything other than God's perfect holiness separates us from perfect holiness because it's not perfect holiness. And that's where the stakes of our sin become so significant. The, 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 the murderer is as guilty as the mutterer in separating ourselves from God's holiness. 
the little stuff and the big stuff. Um, there's this next section about uh, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. Well, I didn't commit adultery, but I didn't murder someone. Um, I think we would all agree that not sleeping around but killing people does not make you a good person. And and few people few people would argue, right? Does this section remind you of anything else in scripture that might Ten commandments, but there's something else. There's something else that I think is putting a finer point on this because it almost seems absurd to say, well, I don't commit adultery. All I do is kill people. Like who would really say that? So I, I think this is pointing to something else. Any thoughts? Jesus talks about adultery and murder in your heart. Remember? Yeah. Looking lustfully at a woman, he says, and you have committed adultery. Better to pluck out your eye. Or the the one who calls his brother Raka fool. So there is a standard here where our intent and our spirit and our thought and our desires in and of themselves are enough to pull us away from God's perfect holiness. And that's the standard that Jesus sets. That you can say, well, I, well, I didn't kill him. Yeah, but you looked at this person with such murderous intent and you wish you just could have. Are you really doing great right now? Was that really what God has asked us to do? That in our anger, if I wasn't afraid of going to jail, I would have punched you in the face as hard as possible? I don't think so. And so I think that it's both making the comparison between adultery and murder, but I think it's also harkening back to the words of Jesus about the state of our hearts. The angry heart, the lustful heart. You are being separated out. You are separating yourself from God's perfect holiness, even though you didn't physically commit the act. Your spirit is far from God. You become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those, as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. What does that mean? The law that gives freedom. What's the law that gives freedom? Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I'm getting another Jesus story here. Anybody else? I am getting in my mind what pops almost instantly is a parable where Jesus talks about the steward who owes his master an unpayable debt. And he begs and he pleads, please, please, please don't throw me and my family and my children into debtor's prison, please, anything, anything. And what does the master do? He forgives him. And what? And being forgiven of the unpayable debt, what does the guy do next? He finds his friend who owes him 20 bucks. And he threatens him and says, if you don't pay me right now, I'm going to throw you in jail. The master finds out about it. And now this guy's back on the hook for everything. And this, you know, mercy is the point being made in the parable. And I think it's the point being made here. The law that gives freedom is going to be God, is going to be Christ's law of grace. So act like God is going to judge you mercifully. Is God going to judge you mercifully? In his grace, he judges us in Christ's righteousness, not our own. Therefore, how should we be judging other people? Yeah, don't judge somebody on a standard that you don't want applied to you. Do judge them on the standard you want applied to you. God, when you look at me, please look at the righteousness of your son. But allow me to judge Bruce on whatever standard I want. 
and beat them up for it. No, we should have we should apply the same standard to other people with how we treat them that we are expecting Christ to be judging us mercifully. And if we don't, what happens? Well, we might just get judged on our own standard. So you better pick a good one. That, that reminds me of how many times we will hear people who are actually delighted that someone might be going to hell. Hmm. Well, they're just going to hell. And they're like, sort of feeling good about that. Yeah. It's like, could you more trust yourself? And whether here, the theology is substantiated or not, sure. it's still that emotion of feeling like. Here is the obvious application of the aphorism there, but for the grace of God go I, which should fill us with a sense of gratitude. Because who merits eternal separation? Everybody who sins, I am included in that set. So meriting separation is not the standard I want to be applied to me because I won't make it. Yeah, I don't look good in that on that one. Um since no one approaches the throne of grace without that grace, then that is something that we ought to be willing to apply to somebody else. Because we're, we don't get there any other way than, than they would. God's graciousness. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? The same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And this is one of the most essential passages within James, like to, to understand the thrust of the epistle. It happens very, very clearly in this, in this section here. Faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Um, I, I think it's, this is also a very pointed illustration that makes me wonder if he hasn't seen this to someone seeing a beggar and basically saying, God bless you, good luck, which is, you know, keep warm, be well fed. Um, but not doing anything about it. There, if there is a spiritual intent to that, let's say it's honest. Let's say it's an honest thought. I, I actually want well for you, but I'm willing to do zero physically to make that happen. How useful is that spiritual intent? What about, um, what about the spirit? They never come out. Yeah. What about it? Because people are going to those monasteries and asking for food and warmth and they're not getting it because the monks choose to pray instead? Or, or just because they're suffering somewhere in the world, shouldn't we be engaged? What's... Well, let's say um, let's say Bruce is Right. Let's say Bruce is um, not doing very well and I feel all kinds of things. Yes. And I pray for a good thing. Right. But I don't get up and go over and hold it and do anything and I just pray for a good Okay. Sure. Well, I would say that I think it's an open question. Is your is your prayers are not nothing? We are convinced that the, that the intercessory prayer is something and something substantial. But is that all you, um, by saying is that all you should do, I think there is, 
there's both a practical limit, like we can't do all things for all people, otherwise we would never get anything done at all. But I think this is more about an attitude that says it's never my responsibility to do anything about it. And maybe there's a time and a place where there isn't, and maybe there's a time and a place where there is. But if you've closed off that possibility, what is what is the use of that? Um, remember, it's not saying it's wrong. He actually says, "What good is it?" There's a there's a there's a a utility attached. What's the usefulness of saying that? And we could say, "Well, the use is I am actually praying, and God hears that, and it might be somebody else's responsibility." Um, I'm not going to say there's no good, but maybe there is other good ought to be employed as well. And I would suggest it's more along the lines of having the habit of never following up or following through when the opportunity is clear. Um, for somebody to say, I am hungry, that's pretty concrete. It's pretty specific. And me to say, well, I hope it all works out for you. Um, that is, you know, that's that's maybe a different response. Um, so it is, it's a pretty sharp contrast. And I'm not saying that this is something that we ought to pat ourselves on the back when we do do it, or we ought to, you know, be bereft when we don't. But remember, this is being very stark all the way through that none of us are going to get this right perfectly and all of us are going to be reliant on the mercy of God for the ways that we have not done what we should have done. But there's a difference between saying, I didn't do it, God be merciful to me, versus, oh, no, 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 I said I'd pray for him, that's plenty. Like, even if you didn't do it, that you understanding that, you know, God's merciful for me when I screw it up and I don't follow up and you know what, I probably should have. Versus, no, 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 that was more than sufficient. I mean, I gave him a thumbs up. What more do you want me to do? Um, what about the opposite of that? People who are like, I'm very much the hands of Peter Christ, but I'm not very spiritual. Yeah. I hear that one, sure. Which is sort of the reverse. Well, um, and that's, I think that next paragraph is going is to help put that together. Show me, somebody will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith by my deeds. Uh, here is, again, that, that what ought to be inextricably linked. Our faith and our works, our spirits and our bodies. If you say I have faith but no works, isn't that like having a spirit but no body? We call those ghosts. When the body is dead, we consider the person gone. Well, I have works, but I have no faith. In reverse, what would we what would we consider a living body with no soul? A zombie, um, you know, a vegetable, uh, somebody who is unresponsive on a ventilator an empty vessel. I mean, both of those sound like death. Um, uh, yeah, Charlie and I were just talking about that uh, a couple of weeks ago about the, there's a, the medical criteria for death prior to organ transplantation. And that's been a medical ethical question for decades. When is somebody dead enough to transplant organs? Because you don't want to do it prematurely and basically kill someone to harvest them like they are a commodity. But you also, some of these organs can't be transplanted if you wait too long. So what is the appropriate time? Especially when somebody, like, this is not against their will. Like, I'm an organ donor. I, I want this to happen. So, you know, what is it? And for a long time, what they refer to as, as, as Harvard brain death was the criteria, which meant, like, flatline electrical impulse within the brain, like on an EEG. 
The problem with that was it was so past the final stage that a lot of the tissue had started to degrade and you really couldn't transplant several things. And so they started backing it up and they've had to go here and they had to go there until they can come up with what seems like the best course of action. So to me, this is not completely dissimilar when we talk about a body, the works are there, but there is nothing behind it. And it's like a death. Um, the soul is there and it's alive and vibrant, but the body is dead. What? It's like a death. It's, neither of those are healthier living. But I feel that sometimes when I'm struggling with my faith, if I do works, my faith is really different. Man, and there I is. Times when I don't want to do works, but then I mean to my faith that I feel motivated to engage. So that thing is to engage the body when the body's not willing and then the body's willing, the spirit isn't. So for me, I kind of lean into one or Oh, 100%. Another. Then, then that duality goes away. I'm like, oh, I'm back on track. But I, that's that whole big thing. Well, God, God, I think everybody's right. God built us as, as body and soul intended to be in unity. And it's when they, it's when they operate in disunity that there's a problem. Um, one of the things that I, I, I offer quite, quite often in like premarital counseling or marital counseling, uh, but this is, this is actually active and operative in a lot of relationships. When you don't feel loving towards the person, choose in your will to act in a loving fashion. Mm -hmm. The emotions will come. But if you commit to acting lovingly, and I've heard people describe it as fake it till you make it, but I think that almost denigrates our will because sometimes it's about the choice. I'm going to make the choice, even though my emo because emotions wax and wane like the moon. And we're not always in control of how we feel at any given time. But our bodies and our souls are so intended to work together. You just try to act consistently lovingly towards someone and prevent the loving emotions from coming back because they absolutely will. That's true. It's just the way we're built and, and, and it's the way that we work. And here James is basically saying, if you want to be alive, which we do, your faith and your works and your body and your soul ought to be making the same message, communicating the same thing. They ought to be working in concert because that's the way God built us. And when you have one and not the other, that's where the problem is. Um, for people who do good, but think and feel rotten and terrible i would say it's better than doing bad but you're missing so much and that's that's really no life to try to hold on to and the people who think only good thoughts but do absolutely nothing good well what good are you you know are you sure your thoughts are as good as you say they are because i see zero evidence of it shouldn't it come out in what you say or what you do and i think that's where we are with this you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I love that line because it's so poignant and creepy. But it's basically saying um, there is a difference between knowing that God exists and actually trusting him, loving him, following him. The demons know that God exists. You don't want to be a demon, do you? Like that, just the factual knowledge is not enough. And I think we would say that for a lot of stuff. To say that, oh, that's my child, but you treat them like a stranger. Are you really acting like a parent? I would say no. Um, that's my friend. Yeah, but all you do is berate them or ignore them. Or, I mean, are you really friends? You know, our, our, our intent and our actions needing to be together you foolish person do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless was not our father abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son isaac on the altar you see that his faith and his actions were working together his faith was made complete by what he did and the scripture was fulfilled that said abraham believed god it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called god's friend you see that a person considers righteous by what they do not by faith alone and i think that's significant Faith and works are not set in opposition to each other. He didn't say the faith 
without works is 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 better or worse or wrong or whatever. They're they're just supposed to be together. It wasn't just the faith. It wasn't just the works. We need both. In the same way, not was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And uh, even you know two different Old Testament allusions, Abraham and Rahab. You know Rahab in particular. Why is Rahab considered righteous? Why is Rahab a prostitute of all people? specified by name in the genealogy of Christ. Because what she does and the hope that she has, and she, she, she tells Caleb and, and, and the spies, I know you're going to win. I know. Oh, we're in a walled city. I know you guys are going to win. And when you do, will you remember me? It's, you know, the faith combined with the actions, despite her background and that's the difference so again this is the practicality of james and i think that connection within lent bodies and souls faith and works our spirits and our actions and behaviors all working in concert anything else okay well, we'll hit chapter three next time.